Good morning. This is Monday, January 10th in the year 2000. This is the first tape we've done uh, in this century. This is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing veterans oral history program. And this morning we have with us Laszlo Riesner. Did I pronounce your name yes, correctly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning and welcome, Laszlo. Good morning, sir. Do you mind if I ask your age? No, I'm 77 years old. And what is your current address? Uh, 7 Vista Road, Wellesley, Massachusetts. And are you married? Yes, I am married with Judy 45 years. And we have two children. Peter is 41 and Robert is 35 years. And we have two grandchildren, Alex, 7 years old, and uh, uh, and sister is uh, nine years old. Seven and nine. And, and Victoria is nine years old. That's a that's a good grandchildren. Good family. Where were you born, Laszlo? I was born in Budapest, Hungary, 1922, October 3rd. And you were raised there, um, I take it. Of course, uh, I was uh, finished my uh, grammar school. And after our grammar school, I was able to go in the boys' home and live in the boys' home three years when I studied as a, 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 a tailor student. In Hungary, it was a, a very common if somebody didn't get higher education. After our eight years uh, public school, they learn a trade. I was able to get in this uh, Catholic Jesuit home when I get nice uh, education and meantime I was able to go in the uh, shop and working the five days in the tailor mm -hmm. trade. Could you tell us about your family, your father and mother, and did you have any uh, brothers or sisters? Yes, I had a sister. She's three years old there and she also went in the, a girl's home. She became a seam dresser. My father was a shoemaker. He was a hard-working man who worked all lifetime. And my mother, she was a housekeeping, uh, raised the children and uh, take care for our family. What did your, um, your mother do other than that? Well, my mother, uh, she used to have for uh, part-time, different time, uh, uh, different store helping a uh, sales clerk and uh, help to bring home a little mm -hmm. more bread in the table. Incidentally, I was able to bring her out twice in this country a couple years ago. Oh, that's fine. Uh, we'll uh, ask uh, you about that in a minute. Um, we're very pleased that you're here today because you represent a point of view we, we haven't had the privilege to uh, here and here. Tell us what it was like to grow up in Budapest, in Hungary, as part of the Eastern Bloc before the war. And of course, before the Second World War, Hungary was a completely different country. 25 years was ruling uh, Miklos Horthy was a governor, and Hungary was a a democratic country, so many different uh, party, and uh, except communist party. Communist was uh, illegal before the Second World War. And uh, of course, at that time, uh, Europe was already in the get involved, a lot of war and fighting, but uh, Till I, till I get in the uh, 21 years old, I was just uh, watching what's going on. And uh, I had to wait when I get 21 years old, then I served the Hungarian army. Okay, so uh, if the war had, so this is um, past 1939, the war in Europe started in September of 1939. Um, you were how old then? About 20? About uh, 19 and 19. 20 years old. All right. right. And then can you tell us what your recollection was of the coming of the war? 
the uh, invasion of Poland, and you hear, you know that somebody is knocking on your door. Of, of course, it was a very exciting and very nervous time because Hungary was very close to Germany, and uh, we know this uh, fascist government, uh, uh, they want to take over. They already started 38, 39, so it was a very nervous time because uh, Hungary, the uh, fascist part was very small, very illegal in the 1939 and 40. Unfortunately, when the time went on, 1942, Germany, after took, us, uh, took over Austria, took over the Hungary also. So that time, 1942 and 43, end of the 43, became a, a Nazi government in Hungary mm -hmm. for a couple of months. All right. So you were drafted into the army in Budapest in 1943. The, um, where, where did you go for training? In Budapest outskirts, uh, we call it in Saint Andre. This was a, a military base. Mili uh, was a big uh, school. Was was uh, they use it for a, a military headquarter, for a, a home, and was a, as a large uh, um, outpost when. Uh, uh, plenty of room for a military exercise, marching, and all kind of military instruction. What kind of training did you get? I, I get a end of end of end of basic six weeks training, and after uh, I was uh, have to handle a machine gun, and uh, this was a, a part of the uh, army. One part of the brigade working with a rifle, and the other half was working with a machine gun, and was working uh, side by side. After six weeks, uh, what happened to you in the army? After six weeks, uh, our form was was very fast. They came to they came to in the Hungary from a west uh, east side and uh, Romania get involved, and we just heard in the Romanian uh, government also changed the side, used to work with the German side, and uh, Romanian officer, they took over all, all uh, uh, German officer, and they si uh, changed the side, and was fighting with the Russian side. Then the front came to the Hungary. Uh, Hungary was a, a small nation. They tried to fight in Budapest. They put on a big fight, but I was in the southern part in the country when the, we have a big, a big fight and uh, my uh, military uh, military group get involved in the fight and uh, one part they went in the uh, west and one part they get, get hurt, get military place, and the third part gets captured. I was with the third part and I get captured. You were captured by the Russians? By the Russians. And many of the history books today tell you that the Russians were exceedingly hard on, on the people they captured. What happened to you? Were they very bad towards you? And of course, uh, a, a very first minute, you know, was surprised. We, we didn't know what's going to happen. And uh, we were right. A very first thing, they took away our arm. Everybody have to take off our arm, watch, take off our, somebody have jewelry or leather outfit. This was the first thing they took out a good boots, good outfit, and change it with the old one. So they stole everything you owned? That was everything, <laughs> but you can use it we right away, took away from everybody. And then what happened to you? Did they take you they to put, a camp somewhere? They put in the groups and they tried to march in the every, uh, through in the couple small village, couple uh, small place, 
we went in the bigger city, call it Kaposvár, then you, they uh, get a, a larger group, they hold it for a, for a while till get a, a couple hundred, then they took us for a Temesvár. This is part of the Romania, it was eastern part in Hungary. This is December of 1944. That's was correct. It a, a very difficult time for you in the winter? We were lucky that time of winter wasn't too cold, but uh, at the very same time in the northern part in Hungary, that's, uh, Debrecen, there was a temporary Hungarian government. And the Russian government, they was thinking, might they use the uh, Hungarian uh, POW, those many soldiers who get captured, to use it against the Germany. So in this lager we stay a couple of months and every military person get his own rank and we daily we marching out in the camp, in and out marching and singing. We was playing like uh, as a soldier. Were they preparing you to fight against the Germans? That's correct. And they was thinking everybody, every officer get back his own rank and try to organize in the Hungarian mm -hmm. defense battalion and might we go in the Russian side. And one day we get a big marching, you know, military marching and music. We went in the railroad station and put up everybody in the wagon. And the wagon has a side, sign said, 12 horse or 40 soldiers. And unfortunately, they, they jammed in 100 soldiers each wagon. You were on your way to where? In the way, uh, way to went in the Fokshani, a, a huge, a, a huge uh, uh, Romanian place, Fokshani. And, and you were in, you were a hundred men jammed into cars that ordinarily would hold 40, 40 men? That's right. That was a site for uh, this wagon they used for a, a military purpose. The French had 40s and 8s, I remember that. That's but you had 40s and 12s, so they carried even more horses. Right. How long does, was that train ride? When uh, unfortunately, this train ride was, took 30 days. 30 days you were sitting, you were feeding, you know, twice a day with a soup and we get some, uh, some bread and we was just starving and uh, we, without moving. So it was a very difficult 30 days. I'm uh, just a little bit confused here. Um, you were on your way to... To go to Saratov. So you were on your way to Russia. That's correct. And Why we didn't did know, did some people tried to slip out some message in the railroad and send something because we was so many, many days we was traveling, so everybody know we go to in the uh, east, we go to Russia. Nobody told us, but everybody know. You could so, tell which way you were going. Is there any way you could tell your family uh, that you had been captured and that you were um, on your way to Russia? No, this time was too late. Unfortunately, some people, they, they throw out a wagon a letters, but uh, before we get in the, uh, put us in the wagon, we used to say it all three months in winter time, and I tell you the truth, my father, he came from Budapest because he spoke perfect Romanian, German, he spoke five language and he came in the lager because my mother sent him, he told them, bring home my son. And unfortunately, I didn't listen to my father. I told them, we are soldiers, we are walking in and out in the lager and we have no problem. And I made a big mistake. I didn't listen to my father. You had the option to go home with him? Well, if I uh, excuse, if I try to escape, mm -hmm. 
maybe I have 50-50 chance if he took me in the Romania someplace because uh, of course I have to get rid of my military outfit and uh, I have to take a chance to a Russia don't capture again. Yeah. But I didn't took a chance unfortunately. Then tell us more about this train ride that took 30 days. How did, how did you survive that? Well, of course, that time everybody was young, 20, 21, 20, uh, age was between 25. You see, when you are just sitting, lay down and next to each other without any movement, was very difficult. I, I remember when after a 30 days we arrived, and you know, railroad car is so high, you have to jump down in the floor. So everybody went jumped down, everybody fell down, everybody fell up, and we had hard time to stand our own feet. But finally, our group was able to, after a couple hours, try to stand his own feet, to walking, and we was marching our new place, when was mm -hmm. a, a new big school was converted for a a POW headquarter. Laszlo, did any of the people you got on that train with die on the way? No, no not in this time. At least in my group, I haven't uh, heard it. But uh, probably this time, uh, I don't think so, because so young people, when you are 21, 22 years, and you get the water and bread, you can survive. You know, young people get more strength than an old timer. Was it something you said before? Um, the Russians treated you pretty much as they treated their own troops. Yes, uh, actually, I, I don't have so specially complaining because this question just remind me later on when I working in the fields, you know, in the Russia and we sit down, and the Russian people sit next to us, and they said, Davoitsi kushai, this means uh, eat with me, because one hungry people usually understand the other people. Yes. And we learn our Russian language, and the, those people usually, they said, someday you go home and you'll be a free man, but we have to stay over here rest of our life. Tell us, you, you just described jumping down off the, the train, uh, pretty weak and not used to walking after 30 days. Tell us about this new camp that you went to. Well, actually it was a, about a three floor high. A big school was converted for a, a home for, a, I believe it was about four or five hundred people. And of course those big uh, rooms, we, we, we were sleeping next to each other in the floor. And was a German lager, everybody speaking German, and that's a place I pick up a, a German language, because I didn't know before a German language, but we stay over there two and a half years, and uh, a Hungarian was maybe 150, just a small number. It's about five, six hundred was a German. So all, all uh, commandant, everybody was German. Were the, they used German language. Were the German troops and the Hungarian troops treated equally by the Russians? Yes, yes, more or less as everybody. And we try to selling each other and try to communicate. And uh, I, I was able to when I uh, went in the shop, uh, doing a few, a few things, I made a few gloves, a few hat, and a few things when I was able to sell the German and I sell in the uh, civilian people. You mentioned the word shop. What kind of work were you doing? Well, we went to a military, uh, a big uh, zavoda, factory, uh, uh, factory zavoda, one room was a Russian, a Russian group, in the other room was about, I think it was 26, 28 
Hungarian, uh, Hungarian prisoner, and we was producing a, a military overcoat. But in this country, you call it overcoat, but over there they call it chenille. So you were doing tailoring work? A tailoring a work, a military production. And of course, this was completely new because I never did in Hungary this type of work. But uh, when you're operating a, 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 you know, a sewing machine and you learn a different country, Everything is different, but you are quick to learn how to operate and how, how to do produce a, a, a you present section in your work. Of course, it's a section work, mm -hmm. you know, production line. Describe a typical day as a prisoner of war of the Russians. What time did you get up in the morning? Well, of course, uh, uh, Andre and Arbat, uh, they was yelling German, you know, six o'clock. So everybody went for a, a soup about seven o'clock and no. seven. Who yelled in German? Well, a German commandant, you know. So the Germans ran the camp? Yeah, they was running a camp, you know. A Russian, they give a, a right because it was easier to control all people, you know, who somebody is yelling what language what everybody is understand because at the beginning we don't know any Russian. But of course, uh, time has went on, we picked up a, a Russian language also. So I was uh, able to later on do a little business when, yeah. uh, when you are uh, do, uh, producing some, uh, some items and uh, if you have chance you can sell it and you was able to buy a, a bread. Okay, it's six o'clock in the morning, they're telling you to get up. Um, then what? Well, you, you see, everybody sleeping with a uniform, so no facility, no changing clothes, nothing. Of course, uh, every two weeks they give a new uh, clean shirt on their wear. Every two weeks, every two weeks uh, we went in the bathhouse. And every uh, two weeks. Every two weeks. And uh, once a month we get a medical checkup. But a medical checkup is uh, sounds like a, a joke. But we were standing, Andre said, in the whole line, and usually came here and uh, a female doctor, medical, and watching the tooth. Everybody has a tooth he can eat, and with one finger touching your buttock, you still have a little muscle so he can walk and work. So this was a a physical, monthly physical checkup, once a month, because those people who was very weak and was not able to work, they put in the difference brigade, those stay home and they clean the lager. But a, a healthy, healthy people, everybody have to go out to work. There's a great difference in, in camps. There's very tough, high security, there's minimum security and there's some that pretty um, lackadaisical, total lack of security. Were you able to leave the camp and go anywhere? No. Of course, in, in this camp was in the four corner, was those with a machine gun, somebody watching us, nobody can leave. You were fenced in then? Fenced in. But when you see you are about four to five thousand a mile from your country, nobody is thinking about escaping. This escaping just remind me, I think only one person they tried to escape. Then they shoot it because they said, uh, if somebody escaped, they have a right to shoot. And they bring it back. Uh, I, I, I don't remember was a Hungarian or was a German, but they bring it back in the dead and they show in the arrest so mm -hmm. nobody should escape. In your notes and what I got from you before we began this tape, um, were you ne near or on the Volga River at this time? Oh, of course. A Volga River is a huge, Europe's largest river. 
and this is just remind me interesting uh, interesting business because in the shop we working five days Monday to Friday and Saturday Sunday usually we went out uh, uh, Volga River just a mile we were walking and we uh, unload a big boat we went down in the boat in the way down and bring it up in the big basket of salted fish. Then we took her in the a truck and loaded a trucks. It, our trucks delivered a, a fish for different parts of the city. What did you do? Th where did these fish go? But the salted fish, uh, they was feeding in the different hospital, different factory. Mm -hmm. Because in the Russia is a common thing, so every factory they have their own kitchen and they they uh, they they feeding his own mm -hmm. working people. Now, when you're working on this boat, were you under guard? You're still a prisoner, correct? Well, that time we get a little bit easier circumstance because everybody, when we go to work, you know, one guard. Walk, walking front of the 25 people and one guard is behind them. Those are, 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 are protecting us also because I remember 45, a beginning many times when we went to work, those invalid Russian who get to one legs and they was chasing us, they want to beat us, you know, because uh, they lost the legs and was uh, angry for a, a POW. So this time, you know, our guard, you have to protect us, nobody touch us. But when we're working and we have a, a 15, 20 minutes lunch time, day time, I was able to bribe this very same uh, uh, guard. I gave them two cigarettes and I said, I go to in the uh, bazaar for a few cent, a few minutes. The bazaar. A bazaar. Yeah. Bazaar is a free market. Everybody is buying and selling. And I was uh, quick to learn because I saw in the boat a Russian officer came up. Then they opened a gymnastork, uh, a Russian blouse, military blouse, and they threw one fish in the right, threw other fish in the left, and uh, start a cigarette, op uh, light a cigarette, and walk down. So I learned a trick very quick. You know, when you are 21 years old and hungry, you're always thinking, how can you uh, buy a piece of bread? So in the lager, I was made two nice long pockets, one in the right side, other in the left side. So I put each uh, a fish. And lunchtime, I, I told the uh, 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 guard, I go in the bazaar, I'll be back when I buy them. Let's make sure. I'll be back. Wait a minute. That's a very good story. Let's make sure everybody gets it. You put f pockets inside your coat. In, the, in the, my pants, right? Oh, in your in pants. the lager, I, I, I work at night time. Okay. I always get, then you, always get thread and needle. Then uh, you went to the boat and you kind of slipped fish in each one. That's and right. And then you went to the bazaar with the fish. What that's happened correct. then? I said, predais, this predai, this means this fish for sale. Over there, everybody is buying and selling. Of course, when you get a short time, you selling lower price than a Russian. So I was able to get a few rubel, five minutes when I show in the two fish, and I was able to buy a two, three pound uh, bread. This time was uh, very important because a, bra a bread keeping your life, and we are 21 years old, we are always hungry. You said a few minutes ago that when you sat with the Russians, they were very kind to you and, and um, understanding of your situation. Can you tell us a little more about that? You see, in the factory, sometimes we work different places, not just a boat. In the factory, after a, a year or two, you was able to pick up a Russian language. Then you can talk with a, a civilian a little bit closer. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually those Russian workers, they look around, and if you don't see any officer, 
they didn't afraid from us, you know, because we get a, a different outfit and we get a sign of POW, so everybody recognized us, POW. So they it was talking us just like with his own people. That's a time we heard when he said, someday you be go home and you be a free man, but we have to stay over here for the rest of the life. So somehow they feel close to us because they felt they are also in the close in their country. Yes, this is uh, the spring of 1945. The war in Europe is, is just a few months away, ending. Uh, the Russians are encircling uh, Berlin. Uh, did you know what was going on in the war? Of course, uh, we, we saw that time we was already in Saratov. We already, but we heard the news, the war is over, and uh, we get the information. Wait a minute, it's over already? At 45. It, May. it ended in May of 45. That's right. Yeah. We was already over there in Saratov, in this lager. Ah, so the war ended while you were there. That's correct. And how did you hear about that? Well, Russian, they said, Voina Kaput. So everybody learned. Voina Kaput is mean, a war is it's over. A yeah. war is again. Yeah. Of course, uh, when you are in a different atmosphere, you know, you find out you learn very quick. Tell me about the communications, uh, how you heard things. Well, of, of course, over there everybody was uh, Russian talking Russian, but uh, a lot of German, they pick up uh, Russian, was a little bit, uh, uh, spend more time with the Russian, so understand more than they talking the German. And the German, a lot of Hungarian was understand the German. So a, a good news, bad news, it always, you know, go very fast. But this time, a very interesting, uh, uh, a war was over, you mentioned, 45 May, and we one transport in very same, this lager came October, came about uh, uh, 500 people, and we asking, where you come from? In from Budapest. They said, when did you get captured? I said, October 3rd. I said, October, the war was over, May, how can you get captured? He said, put on a big soccer game, the Hungarian army and the Russian uh, Red Army soccer. Of course, you know a soccer is a number one sport in the, everywhere. And after a soccer game, put in the four exit, difference, uh, two machine guns uh, people each exit and separate a man under uh, 60 and over 18, 20 with a female and uh, all males was 18 to 60 put in the separate and put in the railroad car and ended up and I said, we find out, they said, uh, Voroshilov this general, they promised to Stalin about a million uh, plan in the Budapest and was missing about uh, uh, 40 or 50,000. Then they captured after the soccer game. Okay. Um, if the war ended in May, and theoretically you were supposed to go home then, what happened? Well, of course, when we get in the Saratov, that's a good question, because we get the same philosophy. But we saw over there Saratov, a group was working, and in the square four corner, watching with a machine gun guard. And we was asking, who is those people? And they said, Churma. Churma is mean, those people who get a a short period uh, labor, f uh, forced labor work. They did some very small minor things in the country. They give him the six months, one hour. Somebody take home a school driver from a factory or any minor things, you know. They give a six months, one yard, a uh, one year. And those people was a main labor force because was working free for a government. 
Because civilian usually they don't like to work. Just a, a, a work, uh, a, a, a forced labor did a, a production work in Russia. When were you finally freed? Where we, we finally get free, uh, end of the uh, 48, because 47 in the Western nation, England and French is mostly in the USA, they was put on a pressure to Russia. A war is over two years. Why don't you send it on a, every people go back in his country? So finally, 48, because meantime I, I went for a different second place, Ulyanovsk, and I find out much uh, difficult job because I have to work outside and I was a city boy. And for me, it was very difficult to dig in a frozen, a frozen uh, ground because it was a, a huge work was on from uh, from uh, Uryanox to Moscow on the ground gas. They lined, laid down a very few, a very big cable, was about six uh, feet diameter, a big pipe to heating in the, some part in the Moscow city. So you were kept on as forced labor? We was doing for a couple of months, and that time, that time uh, my health went down here because uh, inside work was okay and uh, had, had no problem, but, but when we work outside and was very cold, yeah, and uh, our physical work, I, I, after a couple of months, I I get uh, wet shape and uh, that that's the time I, I has a rough time end of the 47, but finally when he came a 48 and start to deliver back in the people. Send them home. Send it home. Yeah. So that's the time, uh, 48, they put us in the wagon, and when we arrived in the Hungarian border, they select, uh, it was a health examination, and they find out I get a TB. Laszlo, at, during that time, were you able to contact your family and tell them you were alive? Once we send a, a Red Cross, Letters. I think we get once a year a permission. So I send, uh, I think one letter they went after uh, three years. So they, my mother and sister, my parents, they was planning, I was uh, believing maybe someday a son is come home. You were in contact with the Red Cross? Well, a Red Cross, uh, they give some paper and give some permit. So the Russian, they distribute those paper. And I think uh, one get home those two, two and a half mm -hmm. years. Did you get any relief packages through them? No, 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 such, no such a thing. You're coming home, you're uh, on the border and they tell you you have tuberculosis? That's correct. What happened then? Well, the next day I arrived in the Budapest, this was my city where I, I was living, so in my parents, sister, and next day I was, uh, uh, went in the uh, military, military hospital and they was checking in and uh, they, they gave me a good treatment. They was treating me like a Hungarian soldier, so I get uh, plenty of food, doctor said, Mr. Eisner just us lay down, eat and rest. And I said, this is the happiest minute in my life because nobody told me eat and rest. And I get a good food. I was underweight and I was walking like an 80 years old man. I couldn't, I didn't have strength. But uh, uh, I get a medical equipment that time. They used to put an ear between a, a, a lungs, a lungs is covered with the co uh, put the air, so in the one part in the lungs, they want to have rest. So when a long rest doesn't work, that's the time they heal. If you get rest and you get more feed. So uh, they feed me very greasy, good food. I was able to put on a, couple of pound weight and uh, my strength come back. 
So I volunteered back after a year. What did Budapest look like after the war? Well, of course, it was very bad shape. A lot of people was missing each other. A lot of people get killed. Uh, 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 politics was awful bad. Unfortunately, first time when was the election, 45, Communist Party got only 10 percent, 8 or 9 percent, and uh, farmer part get a majority. But uh, a, a communist, uh, a communist military, they was occupied the country, and every minister behind the Hungarian minister was next to a Russian officer who was dictating what to do. So it was very bad for the people. Personally, for me, it was good because I get a, a I was, was temporary. I was uh, declared I was, I was not able to work. And when I volunteered back, I get a permit to open a tobacco business. So this was a tobacco. A tobacco. Okay. So this was a, a big advantage because uh, I opened a, a business in the main street. In the tobacco business, you're working for a government. You know, tobacco product, you get 10%. But after two years, it, uh, this main boulevard was an excellent place. That's a place when I grew up. Everybody knew me. My business went off three times as higher to 52. Then a government, they took over. You see, because 10% is profit, and they know how much you're making. And if you're making too much money, a government better off if you take over and give you a monthly wages. Of course, a monthly wages was low. I'll that just ask you a small question here. Um, were your parents all right? And my was parents, your sister all right? My parents was okay. My father got old, and he got, uh, he got a little bit. He's a stay in the bed. My sister, she was okay. My mother was, everything is okay. But uh, I was thinking to start a new life. Then when I, I lost the tobacco uh, income. What year I, was this? This was a uh, 52. Okay, can we fast forward here to 1956? That's correct. About December. Mean, of course, in the meantime, uh, 44, uh, I find a job uh, at uh, a big uh, department store, Judy. And uh, 44, I get married to her. And 44? 54. 54. That's correct. Yeah. And uh, came in the 54 end of the year, we get a very small apartment. And 56 came out the uh, Hungarian Revolution, okay. October 23rd. October, OK. Now tell us about that, because that was the key to a a lot of things that happened throughout Europe, but specifically to you, what does that mean? Of course, the whole uh, 56 revolution, they start uh, six uh, Hungarian university student start a peaceful marching in the city. They start very unspontan, peacefully. And after five, six o'clock, when a, a worker came out in the office in the factory, a civilian people was marching after a, a college students. So it was a thousand, thousand, almost a half million people was marching in the a boulevard. Then they went to the radio station. And the radio station, they get a 10 point and they want to put it in. So the radio announcing. But that time, a secret police who was against, uh, who was in the Russian side, somehow uh, some people get killed, a very first one. The Russian tanks arrived, didn't they? That's correct. And that time, start a bloody, both sides. Of course, many Russians who stay over there hungry 12 years, they said, these Hungarian people very peaceful and very 
de Russen heeft een very good life over daar. They did not want to fight against. And many, many Hungarian, even a police, uh, uh, police department, they said, boys, a back door is open for rifle. So after three, four days, 9th, 9th uh, October, November 3, we were thinking a revolution gonna win, but November 4th, Khrushchev sent a new trip, a new group, Mongolian, uh, those new group, they don't know nothing about where he's going. They was thinking they go to in the uh, Egypt because that time was a Suez crisis, Connor crisis. And th those uh, Mongolian group, group when they came in the Budapest, I was communicate with the Russian and I asking, how come you came over here? Huh? I said, no, we want to uh, defend a, a Suez Canal for Egypt. I said, this is not a Suez Canal. This is a Danube River. Of course, officer, they know where they are. I was talking just with a plane, you know, machine gun guy, who is a, is a soldier. So that time, uh, a new, uh, new group, new military uh, battalion when Khrushchev sent uh, very strong. After 10 days, they ruined the country again, almost just like during the Second World yes. War. What did you and your family do about that? That time, everybody was upset. Everybody was upset. Everybody was uh, yelling. But you see, in the old time, uh, they have no, no, uh, no strength to defend. And of course, I was already a, a 30 years old that time, 31. And married. I, I didn't yeah. throw a, 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 we call it Stalin, a Molotov cocktail. No, many youngsters, teenagers, 13, 15, 16 years old, those throw, they call it Molotov cocktail. They throw in the bottle with a gasoline inside and many, many Russian tank, they blow it out. So the Russia, they lose a lot of, lot of tank and a lot of people, was bloody. But finally they took over and a very sad time in the Hungarian history. And we were young, I, I didn't want to leave my country, but somehow when he, uh, uh, a new, a new, new, new communist uh, leader who used to work with uh, Imre Nagy, Janos Kadar, he went out and with a new Russian trap, a group came with a, a, with a tank then he, he stand up in the a new group side. So this Janos Kadar, he took over a country. Because uh, 56, before we have uh, Imre Nagy, who want uh, independent Hungary. But the Russian didn't let them. That's the reason the, the second troop, they ruined the country and they put in the puppet uh, government in Hungary, just like other country, was Janos Kadar. How did you and your family get out of Hungary? Well, we got a little apartment. I put over there my mother and sister, and we told them we go for a, a countryside. Of course, everybody know our young people go in the border, the Austrian border. Then uh, we went to Austrian border and told them if we get captured or we couldn't go, we come back. But if you don't come back in three days, we went into Austria. But first I was very close to my mother and I asked her, um, would you give me a permit? What do you think about if I leave the country? And he said, my son, anything you decide, if something is good for you, is perfect for me. Was so I Ju was, was relieved. Judy, was Judy with you? Judy was me. That time we was married, yes. one and a half year, Judy. And uh, later on, I was just joking with an American friend. We came from the honeymoon in this country. One way, no return and no deposit. <laughs> <laughs> Who left the country with you? Just you and your wife? That's right. At that time, 200,000 Hungarian. As a matter of fact, uh, a, vice, uh, a vice president, Nixon, was on Austrian border. 
56 November, December. So uh, America and they was helping very much. We was always watching in the Voice of America in the radio. And uh, uh, very strongly as anti-communist. Anti but uh, Russian, Russian, they took over and uh, they didn't give up. And the uh, uh, reason uh, Hungary wanted to be independent because Austria was also in the Russian troop. But from Austria, Russian, they drew out, withdraw his troop in 55. And we was thinking, they supposed to do in Hungary, but the Russian has different idea. The, the Austrians uh, fought with the Germans during the war. Uh, tell us why they let you into their country. Well, you see, the Austria and Hungary has an old historical background, a Habsburg Hungarian Empire. So in the Hungarian and the Austrian has a long, long good relation. Oh, Queen Anne. That's right. That's correct. All right. That's correct. Okay. And, and of course, when we went to Austria, they helping us. You know, when it was a revolution. All right. Where did you go from Austria? From Austria, we went into Salzburg, and there was, was a, a big lager, huge lager. And that time, we had chance to sign up six different Western, Western uh, country, and we was uh, staying the. Uh, Russian embassy front, and we signed up, and we was able to came in the very first American boat. But we arrived from Bremenhaven, Germany. Ten days we arrived in New York City. Of course, ten days was kind of bumpy ride, you know, December. Did you have a, a visa, or did you know you would be allowed to stay in the United States? Oh, that time, that time we know a USA the Latina, alrighty, Latina immigrant because we came by a American boat. How did you wind up in Wellesley, Massachusetts? Well, we used to live in the in the uh, Boston, and uh, I was always a sportsman, played tennis. I went to YMCA, teach my children how to swim. Then uh, in the swimming, uh, uh, in, the, in the YMC, I have a friend in the Wellesley to look around at uh, ladies, and uh, she got a nice shop, and she said she going to give up her room. She, I can take her room. Then I have an American friend, and they asking, uh, I heard you're going to open the tailor shop. I asking how you call it. And I said, gold and needle. I said, where's, oh, no, where's the tailor? And he said, no, it's no good. When you go in the fancy town, you need a fancy name. So he give me a name. He said, how does it sound to you, gold and needle? I said, she, I, I'm going to take a, a board of the director. You know what's a board of director? Your wife and two children. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> when I mentioned, how does this name sounds to you? Ooh, sounds beautiful. So I went to print at a paper and start like a, a professional, professional businessman in the Versailles Square, 73, May 1st, opened a business. You told us uh, a moment ago that I think you have brought your mother to the States twice. Oh, oh that's right. Once uh, before 73 and after month in my sister twice. You know, when you make a little, little money, you try to share with your parents. How about your father? Well, he, he passed away meantime, I think, 60, he was much older. Yeah, how about your sister? And my sister, she came out three times. Matter of fact, I went visiting, and maybe in this year I go once more if I'm still in the life, because she's older than I am, she's 80, and she has problem to walking. And, she asked me to, she liked to see once more. Okay, before we finish here. But somehow just remind me those minutes when I arrived in this country. Sometime I, in the morning when I arrived, when I wake up, and I wasn't sure I'm Russia or Hungary or in a new country. I, I said, she, why I went back to the Hungary? Then I said, no, I'm not back, I'm over here. 
then I, I, I find out I am so lucky I was able to come in this country. Because so many people like to come from all over the world. But in all group, I tell you honestly, wasn't a kind of reason. Because those Hungarians was mostly young, and everybody wanted to start a new life. And I was lucky one of them. Because my wife and even my children, they have a completely different life in this country than in the old country. So I appreciate that and I help for everybody to get a lot of help. Many years ago, and even in Versailles, this was our, our happiest time in this 20, 25 years that we spent. I belong to a two club, a Rotary club, a tennis club, and we are very active. And we have so many friends, and we are very appreciated. We find Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I